Well, I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, what a great time we have with our Bible study when we get a chance to spend a little time together, albeit online. Uh, I do want to make sure that you know you can always catch up with us on PC, uh, peopleschurch.org. Uh, you can also catch us on uh, YouTube and Facebook as well. But we're certainly glad that you're here and we're going to learn some interesting things. We're in a new series and this series is really interesting. It's when people see Jesus, what happens? We're going to find out a couple of things today and it's going to be very interesting. So today's session is basically called would, would be followers of Jesus. So what are those who would talk about it and would be followers, but maybe end up not? What's going on there? We're going to find some things that I think are going to be very interesting. And have, have you ever thought about what it would be like if you were sitting across the table having coffee with Jesus and he asked you to join him? Uh, what would that be like? What would you be willing to give up? What would you be willing to do to drop everything and go? Would you be a would-be follower or would you be a for-sure follower? We're going to learn a little bit about that today. It's going to be an interesting session, so I'm glad you're here. Let's start our reading out of Luke uh, 9, 57 through 62, and we're going to follow a few cases of some folks who were asked to join Jesus and see what they did. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, verse 57 starts like this. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. That's an interesting part of scripture. We'll learn a little more about it. And to another he said, follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. Sounds like a pretty reasonable request, but let's see what happened. But he answered him, let the dead bury the dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wonder what that means. We're going to find out. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. Another interesting uh, little scenario that we're going to go through. And then in 62, verse 62 of nine, Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, No one who sets his hand to the plow and lo looks to what was behind is fit for the kingdom of God. So your hand is on the plow, but you're looking behind, and it says you're not fit for the kingdom of God. Now that's kind of an interesting way of looking at things, so let's see what uh, Jesus is talking about and how these three folks responded to him. So let's go to the next thing. The first man said he would follow Jesus anywhere. Now, I, I would hope that would be my response as well, your response, I'll follow anywhere. Jesus told him that he has no place to lay his head. That seems to be quite an unusual response if you think about it and might make you scratch your head a little bit. What, what's it all about? I, I wonder what it really means. Well, in effect, Jesus is telling this would-be disciple that you will not have a home if you follow me. Now, I'm sure that that was not what the man was looking to hear, that he wouldn't have a home. Most of us probably would like to hear that things will be all rosy and beautiful and what a great thing it will be, how easy it is to follow Jesus. I'm sure that that's what I would like to hear. I think you probably would like to hear that as well. But if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to follow Christ, then you've got to be willing to leave your home and the lifestyle that goes with it. We'll look at this in a little more depth in just a bit, but you've got to be willing to leave. That's going to be an interesting thing to remember. The second man, Jesus said, follow me. And the man said, let me go bury my father. Now, that's not an inconsequential request or a trivial excuse to not follow Jesus, to go bury your father. If the man's father had died, then he had an obligation to bury him. Sons often had that obligation, and to do less would offend the propriety of the family. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on here, possibly bringing shame upon the man himself and might cause him to fail in honoring his father and mother, as the Bible calls us to do, to honor your father and mother. 
Yet Jesus essentially told him to let the others bury his father. This section of scripture really caused me to ask some serious questions. You see, my father passed away about five years ago, uh, and he was 90 years old, lived a great life, loved the Lord sincerely. Uh, I learned an awful lot from him. But I can't imagine what it would be like if I were asked by someone to not go to my father's funeral, to not bury my father. Um, I have such a love for him and learned so much from him. He taught me everything I, about the Lord, about the Bible, uh, just was an amazing person. And to not go to the funeral, I, I personally would have some questions. But Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. What does that really mean? What are we talking about here? The word dead doesn't mean deceased. That's an interesting thing when you really look into the Greek and start expounding on this a little bit. Here Jesus is telling this man to follow him and that those who are spiritually dead, and they can stay behind and take care of the funeral. Now that would be hard for me because I'm not spiritually dead. I know my friends and other family members aren't spiritually dead. It certainly gives me a different perspective though to understand the importance of following Jesus and laying down everything else. I know that my father, when he died, entered into the very presence of our Lord and Savior. The third man states, I will follow you, but first, let me say farewell to my family. Once again, uh, do I get to say farewell to Dot? Do I have to say farewell to my wife, Dot? Uh, to my daughter, to my grandkids? Uh, what, what is this all talking about? If we remember our Old Testament well, then we would be reminded that this is what Elisha said to the prophet Elijah when his prophetic call came. In fact, Elisha was plowing when his call came, and he did indeed leave everything behind after he said his goodbyes. But to this man, Jesus said, no one is fit for the kingdom of God if they have a hand set to the plow, yet look behind them. Now, try to picture this. Uh, you're plowing a field, and doing it the right way requires your full attention. Uh, you know, when you uh, look at the farming region here in, in the central San Joaquin Valley, and you look at some of those fields and the furrows, and I mean, they are straight as an arrow. They are just dynamic how they, they go right straight down the line. They're, they're perfectly centered. Uh, they're exact distance from each other. They're exactly where they're supposed to be. So their full attention and energy of the plower, the farmer, was there. They're uh, looking ahead of them. They're focused, and they can lay down row after row in perfectly straight lines. Now, we do have some technological abilities to do that uh, by GPS now, but think about most farmers still have to look ahead to plow a straight row, and they focus on what is ahead. The field will be then be able to produce a maximum field, a maximum yield for this whole you know, crop that's going to be done because everything was done in order and the way it was supposed to be. Now contrast that image with someone who is plowing yet is looking behind them. So they're plowing in this direction, but their eyes are looking back behind. How straight do you think that row is going to be? It's not going to be very straight. We're going to be weaving all over the place. And if you've ever tried to back up a car without, you know, without having a, a sense of where you're going, you notice how sometimes it can get so crooked. So you have to be looking in the direction you're trying to go. We all know that their lines would be crooked if you're looking behind while trying to go that way. Now, if I'm trying to go that way, I'm okay. But if I'm trying to go straight ahead, my lines are gonna be crooked. And the field will be so poorly prepared that the crop will not flourish. The rows will be a mess and anything but straight. Now, Jesus is telling this man about the kind of focus and dedication that's required to be one of his followers. It's not just a haphazard thing, oh, I hope things go well. It's focused, it's intentional, you know exactly where you're going, and you have to have that dedication in order to follow Christ. 
This section of scripture in the words of Jesus gives us a very strong message that if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be prepared to leave your former life behind. You leave your former life behind. If you're married, it doesn't mean that you leave your spouse. You're not obligated to become homeless and you're not obligated to take a vow of extreme poverty. What does it mean is something else. It means that the former life you need to leave behind is the life of sinfulness and a lack of focus. So you're leaving sin behind and you're, you're leaving your lack of focus and you're targeted in, focused in on where you're going. It's our gossip, our gluttony, our false witness, our slothfulness, our envy, our greed, our selfishness, and so on that we are to leave behind. It's so hard to hear all of these things because we often can convince ourselves and have a good excuse for many of those things. We can easily talk ourselves into excuses and why it's different for me than it is for everybody else. But we know that not to be the, the case. And you know what I'm talking about, how easy it is to fool our, even ourselves with our own self-talk about why it's okay for me to do something. It's the life where we don't get to pass judgment on our neighbors. It's a life now with Christ where we want our enemy, we don't want our enemy to be condemned and to suffer. You know, it's interesting. We, we don't get the chance to do those kinds of things. We, we take a different perspective. We pray for those who uh, despitefully use us and, and abuse us. It's the life where we complain if we are faced with suffering ourselves. You know, we're leaving those things behind. We don't get to hang on to those things because we're now focused on what Christ wants us to do. To leave that behind, that life behind, we must not judge. We must not judge others. We must love our enemies and pray for our persecutors. We must love our neighbors as ourselves. We must carry our cross. We must love God with our entire being and everything that we are or are to become. Boy, that that's clearly takes an amazing focus. It's easy to say, I want to leave my sinful life behind. Why wouldn't all of us want to say that? But it's quite a different thing to actually do it on a daily basis to leave all of those things that are sinful behind. That's going to take a lot of work on our part and grace from the Lord. We must dedicate ourselves completely to following Jesus, knowing that we will stumble, but when we stumble, we must trust God that he will get us past our stumble. Isn't that encouraging to you? That we know we're going to stumble because we're not perfect. We're going to, to make some wrong choices, do some things that we shouldn't do, but we know that God is going to help us through the stumble and get us back on track. We know that we can't do it ourselves. It's not possible ourselves. It can only be done by trusting the Lord and depending upon him to fully give us the strength and grace to accomplish what he wants us to accomplish, to go from would-be followers to true followers of Christ. You see, when we truly meet this Jesus of the Bible, we will be transformed from the weak person that we are to become the person that God wants us to be. It's interesting to note that none of these men have provided their final answer. You know, when I read something about, okay, what did this, the first man do? What did the second man do? What did the third man do? We are not given an answer in the Bible on what their choice was. But there's something very, very special in this. We don't know if they signed on as followers of Christ or if they even considered the Christian life and thought, well, maybe it's too hard and too high a cost for me to accept it. Luke doesn't record a response from them. But you see, it's really quite simple why he doesn't. We are the ones in this scripture. Those three stories, those three men are about us or what are we willing to leave behind? 
What are we willing to do to have a complete focus toward Christ? Will you and I leave the life we know to follow Christ? Or will we find the cost just too high? That's what this whole story is all about in Luke, is what is the cost and are we willing to pay it? Remember, we don't stand alone when we choose to follow Christ because we are given the ability to experience God's grace and his sufficiency to be able to fully embrace this new life in Christ. We simply give up what we cannot keep and receive what we can never lose. Wow, is that powerful? See, when, when God asks me to give up something, I'm giving up something I can't keep anyway, and I'm getting something that I can never lose. How powerful is that? I invite each of you to make your decision to fully embrace this new life in Christ if you haven't already and truly experience God's full provision and his immeasurable love for each one of us. So what we give up, we can't keep. What we get, we never lose. Once you meet this Jesus, you will never be the same. How powerful, what a great lesson Luke has shared with us and I got a chance to share with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just love you so much and we thank you for being with us. We just uh, love the fact that everything is planned out. You know exactly where we're going and you talk about focus. You help us focus on what the kingdom needs and what the abilities are that we need to do what we need to do in the kingdom. And God, you are sufficient in every aspect of that. We thank you for it. Thank you for these great words that help us understand that what we give up, we can't keep anyway, but what we gain, we will never lose. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful lesson about what it's like to be a true follower, not a would-be follower of Jesus. We thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, remember, check in with us. Uh, you can check in at uh, peopleschurch.org and catch our streaming there and, and a lot of other information as well. Also, YouTube and Facebook. Be sure and find out what's going on at People's Church because things are changing a lot as we're getting to explore a little more of what's going on in a COVID-less world that we may be entering. Thanks so much for joining us. God bless. See you next week.